my name is Pete Bonian, and uh, I'm a longtime resident of Fort Townsend. I've been involved in housing issues for several years. The genesis for the community build was um, the result of my making a donation to the giving circle of the Jefferson Community Foundation. And it was a giving circle for the Housing Solutions Network. At that time, I learned that a fellow by the name of Jesse Thomas was looking to build some tiny houses. He was thinking of having a community build. And I was very intrigued by that idea. Yeah, so a group of citizens were kind of worried about the homeless population this winter, and we didn't want to see people left out cold, so um, we mobilized and decided to build some structures. And I was sitting day, one day with a friend, my friend Samuel, and we came up with this idea of getting the community involved, these teams together, and building units to kind of, in one part, to get one step closer to having a tiny house village, or, and two, to get people, get the community kind of inspired and involved with making that happen. So it's, it's been a real blessing and we have four units right here. We have three painted and the community is really showing up and the organizers, thanks to Peter and all his work, have done a great job in getting this going and we're still going. Uh, we're going to build, I don't know, four or five, six more. It's a it's a basic box and we're gonna paint the interior, paint the floor, um, build a bed frame in the back here, um, probably a counter over here, um, maybe some kind of closet unit here. Um, and there'll be there'll be conduit and electrical outlets and a light. And that's it. It's, it really beats sleeping in your car or sleeping in a tent. The supported individual or couple that's living in, in one of these is going to have access to the facilities in the village where they'll be able to shower. Um, I mean, they have to have access to the to bathrooms and a shower. These there won't there won't be any way for them to cook in here, but there'll be other services that'll step in and provide that. Um, the idea is the village has sanitation, ways of bathing and these units are meant for sleep. I'm, I'm Judy Alexander and I was asked to be a part of a community planning team for this project called the Community Build Project. And Jesse contacted me not even two months ago. I mean, it was really not very long ago, mid-September maybe, and asked me if I would use my community organizing skills to engage people in volunteering to help build these shelters. And Jesse said his goal was to have 12 shelters built and ready to occupy for the winter. We have four built on the site here now, mostly near completion. My hope with doing this is that this one effort can really go a long ways to quieting the impulse in so many of us to get into like the not in my backyard syn syndrome, you know, like, oh, I think this is a great project, but not here. Take a look at the world that we live in right now, which is wracked with income inequality. And Port Townsend is a good example of a community of fairly well-off people that have maybe more than they need. And somehow I've been racking my brain for the last two or three years, like how do we rectify this income inequality thing? And I feel like, you know, if we can donate towards the cost of a building and make sure that a homeless person is warm and dry this winter, I believe that OLICAP is gonna be working with some of the residences, residents of these buildings to help them get permanent housing and maybe get jobs and move into social functioning. So After forming the first team, I made many other contacts with people that I thought would be team leaders throughout the community. Uh, Randy Welly was one of them. Uh, Pete Duffy with Blue Heron Construction was another. I began contacting construction companies. I contacted Errol Lumber 
and uh, Carl's Building Supply. I asked them if they'd be willing to be sponsors of the program and Henry Hardware, all of whom answered in the affirmative. Judy Alexander, uh, one of the other organizers, and I went to talk to Pastor Jim Lyman at the Evangelical Bible Church about using the large lot adjacent to the church that the church owns to build these. We didn't have a place to build yet. And when he said yes, that was the final thing that we needed in order to move forward and to build the first couple of units on that site. Peter was an essential part of that, getting uh, ex acceptance and buy-in with the community, and it really started with the churches. How oh, I got involved in the current project right now of the uh, wooden tents, the tiny home village, whatever you want to call it, is the church said we have all this property that really needs to be used. Well, uh, word that we had the property leaked out to some people, and I received a phone call from uh, Peter Bunyan and said, hey, I heard that your church has property we can put some tiny homes on. And I said, well, the answer is yes and no. The answer is yes, we have the property. The answer is no, it's under lease to Olecap. But if you can work something out with Olecap, the Methodist Church will be the least of your problems. Now, there's a lot of people, a lot of moving parts in this, and a lot of people are working on it, and including uh, Commissioner Greg Brotherton, who was also affiliated with Holy Cap, and he's our liaison with the county to make sure that we are in compliance with any county sanitation uh, issues. Uh, hello, my name is Greg Brotherton. I'm a Jefferson County Commissioner, and I've been involved recently in the Wooden Tent Project as a representative of the county. Um, I'm a huge fan of this project, and I, th I hope that it, it ends up being a pilot project with a model that we can replicate in the future. You know, as they were coming up with plans and everything, it was clear that there was interface needed with the county. And I volunteered to coordinate between, you know, our planning department and the Department of Community Development and Environmental Public Health, as we are working on ordinances for basic sanitation for uh, um, homeless encampments and other others like facilities, as well as working with DCD on, on an ordinance emulating a Whatcom County ordinance, which allows for uh, land use exceptions for homeless encampments. So it's critical that the government takes a role in any of these activities to create a robust uh, options for the unsheltered. I'm really galvanized by this project because of, of the so many legs to the stool of support that it gives, you know, from the religious organizations and the, uh, the faith-based uh, support with the location from the Methodist Church, from the real estate and land development expertise of OLICAP and, uh, and Bayside as well, as well as the case management that Bayside is offering, because that's one of the critical elements to any of these programs is to make sure that you have really robust wraparound services to make sure that it's uh, going to work. At the site that it is right now, it, it, it's really slated to be uh, an emergency response and a, and a temporary site because there is uh, plans to use some of the, the on-site septic capacity to build some more affordable, permanent affordable housing. My hope is that this project becomes a template that we can replicate perhaps on public land, perhaps in, on other faith-based organization land, or even in, in, in private land. I think that this can be a robust model and if we can prove with this pilot project that it's safe, it gives good outcomes for the residents and you know, protects, uh, mitigates impacts on, on the surrounding area. I think it could be a, a model that we use repeatedly through the county to, to utilize our more undeveloped and, and lack of urban growth areas uh, to, to our benefit instead of so often uh, it's, a, it's a real constraint on being able to create multifamily uh, housing, which is so, so critical for this, this segment of the housing population. When we realized that we needed to have a shelter to build under, I went to Malcolm's office one night and I walk in and I said, Malcolm, do you know a place where we could build these shelters under like for the next month or two? And he looks at me and he goes, yes. And that was when he told me about the tent. Uh, my sister's uh, son-in-law, my nephew-in-law, I guess you'd say, runs a pawn shop and he gets deals on things. and some rental agency was going out of business and had three large tents. And so they bought all three for a very reasonable price. And they used the heck out of this one for about a year. 
and set it up on their property because they're building there. But they had to move it to build the house. And now there's nowhere on their property big enough for this tent. I'm like, ah, maybe it could help us up north. So it's 40 by 40. Big. It's really big. And it has 10 foot side walls. And right now there's not enough money in the account to finish five more, but we want to do five more. And so there's a current conversation in process about whether we can build five floor units under this tent, one in each corner and one in the middle in order to have enough social distance. So we're not worried about the money in the long run, but we don't really have the money right now. So this project all along has been like, okay, do the right thing. It maybe doesn't fit all the parameters of how projects are normally done. We don't have all the boxes checked and all the approvals given and all that stuff, but we just knew if we didn't get started in September, we weren't going to get done by winter. My name's Todd Armstrong and I get to be partnered with Judy and with Malcolm, at least on the on the edges here, the edge. of building this uh, extraordinary community, small shelter community for the underhoused here. Gary Keister um, knows Lori, my friend, and Lori was talking to him about being helping him project managing things. Gary contacted Lori. She didn't want to do it, but she knew about me. I'm moving here from Seattle. So uh, I came over and was at the first weekend a build with everyone and um, got inspired by what they're what, what we're doing now. Peter was going on vacation. I chose to take over for him. And this is my introduction to Jefferson County and my new community, and I couldn't be more excited. So we're, today is the day we were gonna put up the tent, the start of this production mode for building five more shelters and in inventorying the parts of the tent that came in yesterday afternoon, we're missing the main central crown piece of this giant tent structure. So we're improvising right out of the gate trying to figure out if there's a local welder that can make one for us or if we can have the part which is in California right now, it did not make it on the trailer, if it can be sent up and quickly, maybe by tomorrow. So a so. local muffler guy is gonna make up the eight-sided crown that lets the tent poles all fit together. And uh, we're pretty excited about that. We've seen it so often at Bayside where someone comes in from out of the cold, they're living on the beach or living in the woods and within a relatively short period of time we are able to kind of give them new spirit and they moved on. Many became productive citizens and have jobs that are working and are healthy. As Judy mentioned, these are uh, a lot better than tents. They're uh, waterproof and they're safe and lockable. Where you know, out of the woods, you know, they're oftentimes assaulted and problems just become so overwhelming that a lot of them just drop out of society. So as Jesse well put it, it it's 
truly a community effort. All of these volunteers that they've been able to muster along with vendors in our community, Carl's and Arrow and Fredrickson's who uh, donated significant amount of goods to us for this project. It's a real example, I think, of what we can do as a community when we come together. We want this thing to shoot and, and not bury the nail. How are you adjusting that? I keep seeing you do it, but I don't know. This button, uh -huh. this foot has notches in it. See this? Mm. And so, you know, a certain notch on there for eight penny nails means that the nail will stop where the head is near the surface. And so, Gary just approved us all the money to build the four shelters we've already started. I'm Siobhan Canty, the president and CEO of Jefferson Community Foundation. Jefferson Community Foundation brings together organizations, leaders, and the general public to work together on big issues. So it was a natural when we started the Housing Solutions Network two years ago. The role of the Housing Solutions Network is to educate and engage more and more of our residents here in the issue of affordable housing, both affordability and availability. It was through that network that some folks uh, started to have a conversation about the impending winter and the fact that we had over 150 people on a waiting list for transitional housing. And those amazing volunteers knew something that needed to be done. And they didn't wait for permission, they didn't wait for everything they needed, they just got busy and started building houses. And so it was that the Community Build was born, an incredible story of citizen leadership and, and volunteer engagement. So as they were building, uh, I knew that there was an anonymous donor out there who was very interested in immediate housing for people who needed it, and they were unaware of the Community Build. So I went to the folks at the community build and I asked them what they needed to finish the project. Uh, they gave me a budget. Without their knowing, I took it to this donor and within about four days, they had a $100,000 check in their hands to finish. This was an extraordinarily generous gift and it's also a great example of what happens when you make the perfect match between a donor and their legacy building and the actions of a community. We built four shelters in, was it a week, Todd, or something like that? It was crazy. Professionals like yourself really working fast. It, it was extraordinary. It has been extraordinary. Just the participation, the people interested in bringing their skills. And yeah, Randy, me, and Dave specifically, qualified contractors. We've had a flurry of people participating, and it's just been extraordinarily wonderful. This is just a great effort by the community, but it's just the start. A lot of people criticize tiny houses as not the solution, and they're not, because we're all hoping to have permanent housing for our citizens. None of us want to live in a community where there's homeless people. But we've got to go down two tracks. One track is the tiny house, transitional type housing, and the other is permanent housing. And we have to come together as a community, as the city, the county, the citizens, the clubs, the churches, all of us have to come together to solve this problem. We had somewhat of an epidemic before the pandemic came in housing. At Bayside, we had about 45 people on our wait list. Today, we have close to 160. All of those people are, quote, homeless in some fashion. So we've got a lot of work to do yet. Hey, I'm Wayne Cimenti and I'm with the Community Boat Project. We just built a tiny house for the uh, with a community build. The tiny house was built with uh, paid interns who are all 18 to 25 years old who have never handled tools before. So it's a job training program and a chance to give back to the community and it was a great learning experience for them. Yeah, we call it the Shelter from the Storm program. Paid internships are are funded by grants that we we um, we write. This this uh, particular tiny house. These interns came on uh, slowly during the month of uh, September, and we're all in place. The four of them by October first, 
we got the package dropped around the second week of October. So uh, it was about a two and a half month project for us. They work 12 hours a week. We also, of course, you know, we're in the time of COVID. So um, we were surfing the COVID waves a little bit. We actually had to shut down everything just before Thanksgiving. And then uh, with just one of my lead interns, we did the final fit out. But uh, there were times when Jefferson County had no COVID cases for weeks. And so at that stage, we had uh, volunteers coming in and uh, some high school kids. So uh, uh, there were probably about 10 different people who've had their hands on the project at any one time. We tried to keep the numbers in the shop down to four or five at any one day. Uh, we also have a lot of, of course, the package, the basic package was dropped by the Housing Solutions Network uh, Community Build. But we uh, we were given generously a lot of uh, wood and, and um, different kind of things for the interior from uh, Carl's Building Supply and also this uh, group that uh, gives really nice hardwoods away called Westport Yachts. And we just had things from the shop that we had too, that we had laying around. So we were able to do a, uh, a really nice uh, tiny house and a really nice uh, a really nice interior for it and what's what's really exciting is that I have these interns now uh, all year long now they know how to use tools now they know how to put a building together we're excited to just get going building the next one see I got a call from Peter Bonian um, and he had been to talking to Judy Alexander because back when I was executive director of the school we were actually building tiny homes and I had worked with Judy to um, look at building tiny homes as community residences. Today what we're doing right here is we're prepping all the stock for the bed platforms to go in each of the tiny emergency shelters. Um, we're gonna cut the stock, we're gonna make the frames, do some pre-drilling, and then we'll just go and install them. I'm hoping it will be largely done today. So it's um, a bed platform that will have four frames and then seven slats. Um, on it um, that will take a twin mattress. Yes, uh, this is a very exciting day. We're uh, Lou, L and J is here, and they're doing the site work for us. And they're so good at what they do, we're going to be done today and ready to start laying the electrical conduit and all of it, so it's just super great. I'm Steve. I'm Arnie. And we're old friends of Todd Armstrong's. He, uh, he's the guy who got us involved in this. Uh, he's down there helping and manage the project uh, down in Hadlock. So we, were, we worked for Todd for four or five years on and off. And that's our relationship. Well, we're building porches and a step for the, uh, for the little cabins out there, for the little village. So we're going to fabricate them here. Todd just drug four off and he's going to start fitting them out there and <clears throat> tell us how good we did. We'll probably get four done today. Probably, yeah. It'll probably be three days and uh, days. he's going to give us a little bit more information about the step that goes up to the deck once he, oh, once he fits one. So we'll be building the steps after that. And then the handrail. And so then maybe handrail. another week. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Roughly. Some of that stuff may be fit down there in the field. Um, 
Yes, we are volunteering. We got a lot. We got a lot, plenty of time on our hands right now, and uh, you got to get something done every day. Yes. Judy Alexander and I talked about naming the houses, and I thought it was a good idea. Um, put the word out to the various teams to come up with names for the houses that they had built, and I offered to uh, build make the signs. Actually, I, I offered the services of a friend of mine to make the signs. And Dave Nickel has a machine that's called a CNC machine, a computer controlled router that can carve names and letters and numbers into, into wood. So I uh, purchased the wood, cut it to size, routed the edges, took it to Dave, and we decided on the fonts and he carved the names and the name of the team into these signs and I subsequently put them on the houses. As a general contractor, having years of experience, I've been able to lead the volunteers and sometimes volunteers show up with varying levels of experience in building and it's a learning experience for them and that's been a beautiful thing that they are gaining besides giving giving to people that are in need um, there's this experience of us being in a sharing information relationship that feels good to me as you know someone who's been at it for a long time I enjoy being in that teaching role and helping people learn new things. I am Bodie Labrie this is my brother I'm Brandon Labrie. Family friend came to me and he said hey if you're just trying to do some community work there's this really cool project going on and he just kind of described uh, what was going on here and building homes and getting people who need housing in and uh, for the winter especially and I just decided to come out here and I dragged him into it eventually and uh, some other friends that we have working back there as well. Yeah he told me about it uh, the first day I got back from school for winter break. I go to Pacific Lutheran University in Tacoma and I spent the semester researching homelessness and affordable housing and how those two issues uh, connect and one of the main parts of my research was in tiny home communities and how they're helping with the homelessness crises in cities like Seattle and Portland and all over the US. And so it was pretty exciting that the day after I finished my final for that research project, I came out and got to see my first tiny home community being built in person and see how it actually works. Um, I knew all about like the theories behind it in the, in the research, but I haven't seen one for myself. And it's been really exciting watching it come to fruition right in front of our eyes from just an empty field uh, a week ago to now having you know numerous brightly colored beautiful homes exactly super super satisfying work As, uh, you know this project is a whole bunch of you know people that have incredible carpentry skills and building uh, experience and they're just here willing to just you know offer out advice and help and guidance as far as you know how to just put together stuff and it's just it's really cool and uh, they just offer all the tools all their expertise so it's basically as, as we're helping benefit the community, which is great, we're also getting the necessary carpentry uh, skills to be able to do this in the future as well. So I think it's a really cool package. Christmas Eve day. Christmas Eve day. How, how many weeks have we been working on this project now? We started these under here yeah. December 1st. Okay. So 24 days ago, none of this was here. Well, we're in the home stretch. We are definitely in the home stretch and it's it's exciting. People are tired. Luckily, tomorrow's Christmas, so nobody's going to be working tomorrow that I know of. Uh, the whole project's been energizing. It's been magical and synchronous and things falling into place when they need to. Living with the uncertainty until they fall into place has been a skill set we've been developing. So we're more okay with not knowing until it's time to know, and then when it's time to know, we usually know. So we started out with a pot of like 28,000 bucks at Bayside and then we had to build up from there with donations which we did. People would walk by and say hey I want to buy one of those buildings for you guys how much do they cost? People would walk off the street and give Peter cash to say put this in the kitty 
It was amazing. It was just like that. The whole process has been really supported, and we just feel like, you know, we've got angels on our shoulders. Just. I've been here about three weeks. I just got in on the second half of the build. I remember you were here when we put up the tent. Yeah, yeah. So what keeps you coming back? Oh, just waking up, knowing there's somebody my age who's waking up in a wet sleeping bag. It's, it's 12 houses out of 200 people that need help, but it's a start. Five shelters that are here oh, at the tent. Yeah. Um, uh, two of them are 100% done. Uh, three of them need just a little bit of trim. And then we're hoping that they can be picked up by forklift and moved over to the other site. Fredrickson Electric is donating all of the materials and the employees are donating their time to install the wiring. Hi, my name is Mike Schlexer. I'm the case manager at Bayside Housing uh, in our tiny house village. Uh, they have to pay a program fee, which is 30% of their income. This is standard for Section 8 housing and preps them for the eventual move out so that it won't be too much of a shock when they do move into Section 8 housing. They also have to sign up for a monthly task to contribute to the community of the little house of village. They have to keep their house clean. Uh, they have to take part in a community meeting once a week for self-governance to settle any issues that are coming up or any concerns they have. And they have to do a housing search. So they have to continuously be searching for uh, a place to live because the goal is to move them up and out. This is a, a transitional housing situation and we hope that everyone ends up in permanent housing. That the kitchen is now here and it's a perfect timing for the wastewater tank because now he can get his measurements exactly for where the pipe has. It, this is all perfect. Uh, this is our kitchen RV. Uh, the, the little houses do not have uh, cooking inside. They may have a microwave or they may have a hot plate, but inside our RV we have a kitchen that they can use with a gas stove and an oven. There's a microwave and some other kitchen items in there that they can, that they can use to prepare food and also use as a social meeting ground. Uh, it's also our hub for uh, program due payments and we have our security people who stay here overnight. They stay in the RV. It also acts as a backup shower and bathroom in case there's an issue with our bathroom and shower trailer. Dominic, tell me what feelings are going through your, going through your head right now. I'm feeling blessed. I've been turned down a lot for uh, housing and I never thought it would be this difficult to get it. And so uh, this, is, this is a great opportunity for me. And with the home base, it's gonna save me a lot of time, give me a lot more opportunity and, and I'll be able to handle it. But when you hit, you hit the bottom and it hits you hard and, and you drag across the coals for a little while, it becomes very, very difficult to bounce back. I had to experience it to believe it. I can make a tent work, I can make this work. <laughs> Thank you, Dominic. Thank you so much. My name is Sherry Hansen. Well, I live just down there, and we've been watching as this area has progressed, and they've really worked hard, and it's been fun to watch as the little houses were brought up. They were finished and brought up, and the colors, we've all enjoyed seeing the different colors that they've come up with. And I think it's such a blessing for these people that don't have a place to live. I feel very blessed that I have a place to live. So I waited seven years to get in here. There's a, many people that want to live here, but I, uh, I was so happy to be able to move in here. And it's been wonderful and safe but I'm so happy for all these people because I always think of the saying that, that I've used different times, there but for the Lord go I with these folks that don't have a place to live. If it wasn't for the Lord giving me this place, I would be in their shoes. So I'm really excited. I think it's wonderful. 
Housing First Works. These tiny houses did not just get built without a tremendous effort by so many. The volunteers, suppliers, craftsmen, donors, support of the county, and the support of Pastor Scott, who has allowed us to put this tiny village here on this sacred property. Without a leadership team, things just don't get done. And we've had an amazing group of guys and ladies who have stepped right up and provided that leadership for this project. The group includes Peter Bonian, Judy Alexander, Jesse Thomas, Todd Armstrong, and Randy Welly. I want to say that one of my jobs at the very beginning was to not only work this project, but how can this project become a bunch of other projects of similar purpose of housing our most vulnerable people and just housing our people because we all know that housing is a really huge problem in Jefferson County and across the country. But one of the things we've done to create that community engagement going forward is we've documented this. Uh, we've had Dennis Deneau, videographer over there, document many, many phases of our build project. It's been a hard year, right? It, 2020, none of us are gonna be sorry to see shifting to 2021 tomorrow, but uh, I've considered this project, which has been engaging me almost full time from the end of September until current time as a real godsend in the face of that isolation, because what we have been able to do is to create a community solution to a huge problem for at least 12 people and not have to be so isolated. We were permitted to work halfway through the project in a production mode where we, we took uh, two months to build five shelters and one month to build six. But the point I wanna make to you guys and, and for you to convey this to the rest of our larger community is that when we close our hearts to the homeless, we suffer, we separate, we resist, we are scared, we are angry, we are judgmental. When we open our hearts to our most vulnerable citizens, our hearts expand, the community responds, people thrive, those that have needs feel their needs being fulfilled. I want to read a quick poem and I will warn you ahead of time, it will probably make me cry. It's my favorite poem ever. It's called Kindness and it's by Naomi Shahib Nye. Before you know what kindness really is, you must lose things. Feel the future dissolve in a moment like salt in a weakened broth. What you held in your hand, what you counted and carefully saved, all this must go. So you know how desolate the landscape can be between regions of kindness. How you ride and ride, thinking the bus will never stop. The passengers eating maize and chicken, they will stare out the window forever. Before you learn the tender gravity of kindness, you must travel where the Indian in a white poncho lies dead by the side of a road. You must see how this could be you how he too was someone who journeyed through the night with plans and simple breath that kept him alive. Before you know kindness as the deepest thing inside, you must know sorrow as the other deepest thing. You must wake up with sorrow. You must speak to it till your voice catches the thread of all sorrows and you see the size of the cloth then it is only kindness that makes sense anymore. Only kindness that ties your shoes and sends you out into the day to gaze at bread. Only kindness that raises its head from the crowd of the world to say, it's you I have been looking for. And then goes with you everywhere, like a shadow or a friend. So my blessing to this village is that we Remember, kindness is the deepest thing and that we can all choose to practice that with our most vulnerable populations. Hi, I'm Randy Welly. I was invited initially to participate by 
Peter Bunyan and my neighbor and friend for a long time. We um, built the first couple of projects um, in our neighborhood. Our neighborhood built one and we named it after Peter's wife that died this year, Beth. Beth's house right over here. And in honor of Peter and Beth, it's uh, people like this that are really the salt of our community that really do a lot of work in this wonderful community that we're in. And once he asked me to get involved with one, then I led another and another and oh, they just couldn't get rid of me after that. <laughs> I've been involved since the beginning. It's been such an honor to work with all the volunteers on this project and everybody's support in all the facets. The village here is, is being named Peter's Place. And wow, beautiful. Here's the plaque that Dave and Sizzy put together. A community spirit village. And really, as you can see from all of you being here, the community spirit is strong here. And uh, thank you all for all of your hard work. It's been really great to work with you. It's very hard to know what to say at a moment like this. I'm extremely honored, but it's really important for me to be clear that this isn't about me. This is about us. It's about spirit. This is what community looks like, folks. There isn't much that we can't do together. We can overcome this pandemic by working together. Nobody asked anyone what their background was, what their religion was, what their politics were. None of us cared about any of that as we came together with a unity of purpose. And we can thrive going forward, keeping that unity of purpose in mind. I would like to honor one person particularly who was extremely important to us from the very beginning, Pastor James Lyman of the Evangelical Bible Church in Port Townsend, who offered the property to us when we began building these houses. He gave us the space. He gave us the permission to go forward. I'm grateful for the support of every person here. There are so many people involved in this. Thank you all. I brought uh, the years of general contracting to the community effort. Malcolm Dorn, you may know who Malcolm is. He brought a tent, 40 by 40 foot tent, all the way up from California on a trailer. We put it together and it's allowed us to be amazingly effective. Uh, I'm humbled by every bit of this. I, I, I get emotional even trying to think about it. You know, to be just landed over here like this and be able to uh, participate like this and to get to know this community and vice versa. So um, thank you very much. And Scott, this is a, a prince of a man over here. A uh, little background on the uh, South 7. This is the South 7, or we call it Margaret's Village now, because of a, a lady in our church long before I got here, Margaret Matheson, had a vision along with other church members over 20 years ago to convert this property that was owned by the church. The church has been in this location since 1959, and we have a lot of property. And they said, we would really like to see some housing for seniors that need it. And we have been talking to Holy Cap, and we've been talking to Habitat about maybe converting some of this land to Habitat housing, when all of a sudden I did get a phone call from Peter Bunyan, uh, our, our mission effort at the church. Uh, we, we believe that in the tri area, we're at ground zero. And uh, the acronym for our mission effort is called SODS, S-O-D-S. Somebody ought to do something. <laughs> Be that somebody. And this is what we have here today. 
the somebodies that got together to do something in a remarkable 45 to 60 days that it got done with a lot of cooperation from a lot of people. The blessing I have is adapted from a song entitled Bless This House by Mahalia Jackson in 1956. Bless each house, O Lord, we pray. Make it safe by night and day. Bless these walls so firm and stout, keeping want and trouble out. Bless the roof, though it is small, let peace and joy lie over all. Bless this door that it may prove ever open to hope and love. Bless each bed so soft and warm, keeping us from cold and harm. Bless the folks who live within, sheltering from rain and wind. Bless the workers toiling here, building houses, building homes with love and care. Bless each house that it may be, shelter, home, and security. Bless us all that one day we may live in love and community. And again, that's adapted from Bless This House, a song by Mahalia Jackson. I see a wide variety of people in front of me and united by caring about our community. And that is something that is amazing to see and really gives me a lot of hope for our future. These people are temporarily set back. They've had obstacles in their life and circumstances in their lives that have put them down for some for a considerable period of time. And they just need a break. They just need a, a chance to lift themselves up. They need the stress to be taken off and they need some stability and that's what we're giving them here. Many of the applicants for this program have been applying for our program for years. My list is over 100 people long and 12 units are great, but it hardly makes a dent in the need of our community. If we had 50 units, they could all be filled tomorrow and there would still be a need. And so that is something that as a community we need to address is the availability of low cost, affordable housing, Section 8 housing, and in time, more little home communities in our faith-based communities. Scott, and thank you to all of our team that made this happen. It was a, a journey and one that is not at the, at the end. We are just beginning and we have a lot more to do. We have two tracks we have to go down. We have to continue to provide emergency transitional housing and at the same time we have to provide permanent housing because the housing crisis that we're experiencing crosses all economic lines. Years ago, not that long ago actually, I never heard the, the term the working poor. Now every white paper on housing and homelessness talks about the working poor. So we have to address a number of social economic groups in order for us to, to be successful. We don't want to be a Carmel where none of the workers in the community can live there. They all have to live miles away and commute into to the city to work. So we have a lot to do and we're going to do this by outstanding strategies that we're going to develop and and also for ostentatious dreaming, that we want to find ways that haven't necessarily been sought before, but being unique with the uniqueness that we have in our community. I wanna thank everyone for, for being here today. Pastor Scott, all of the team, all of you that attended. I wanna point out the help that Greg Brotherton, uh, County Commissioner has helped us in, in getting to where we are today, getting through the maze of, of uh, ordinances and all. Woo! So it was very, very appreciated. Thank you, Mike, for your time. That's another amen right there. That's for sure. Thoughts from a resident of Peter's Place. My first morning, I just realized that I slept with the lights off for the first time in a long time. Gratitude. I woke with a smile this morning, grateful for this warm, safe, comfortable home. Gratitude. Grateful for a space to grow. Grateful I got to pay my rent. Grateful for everyone's kindness and thoughtfulness. 
Grateful is not a big enough word to describe the way I feel. Grateful to feel human again, because when you're homeless, you are made to feel less than.